Okay, folks, I believe it's about time to start. Kind of nasty out there today. Everybody's moving a little slowly. So we're glad you're here. We're glad you're here. Please remember me this week as I go to West Virginia to do my brother's funeral. That funeral will be on Thursday at 2 o'clock. And uh, I just simply want you to, more than anything, pray for my safety and travel as we drive there. I don't know what the weather's like in West Virginia, but at this time of the year, it's probably pretty nasty. So just pray for my, my son's flying in to go with me. I don't know whether I told you that or not. Uh, that, that decision... And that was his decision, by the way. But I didn't discourage it. He doesn't know yet, but he'll be the primary driver. <laughs> yeah, he probably does. Others of our church family we need to pray for. There's a prayer list that comes out every Wednesday night. We've had so many folks recently who have been in the hospital with COVID and heart attacks and other illnesses. Just remember to pray for the folks you know about what's taking place in their life. And God will bless you as well as them. All right, let's look at our, re well, let me make a couple at the top of your review sheet. You see it? March the 11th, New Beginnings. Now that's a celebration for senior adults that's going to take place right here in this room. Fried chicken dinner, I believe it's $10, the cost of the meal. And we're going to get a preview uh, on the screens of what the auditorium looks like on the inside. And so that will be a good thing for us. So remember that, that starts at 11 o'clock on March the 11th, 11-11. So come on and let's have a good time together. March the 21st is when we move back into the LMA, hip hip hooray. And when we move back into the LMA, we'll have the couples classes will be meeting in here. Ladies classes will be meeting over there in that area. Men will be meeting back there and then in room, uh, I believe it's 216 on the first floor of the LMA. And so we'll have those classes, those four classes, as we move back into our two worship services, 9 o'clock and 1045, I believe. Our worship service will be at the late 1045 because I chose for us, uh, with very little complication, for that we would rather have Sunday school at 9 o'clock rather than 1045, so that's, that's where we are. All right, now one other that you need to write in, it'll be on yours next week. There will be no class, no class on March 30. That's the week between Palm Sunday and Easter Sunday. There'll be no class that week. The reason being, I'm gonna go see my kids. Uh, and so it's, it's that simple with me. So nobody will, I will just not meet that time rather than me bringing in a substitute and messing up what you already know. It, it's hard to believe. I, I looked at my sheet this morning. We started Jesus, Savior of the World, a study in John. We started on March the 3rd, 2020. It has been one year today. But a lot of it, we were not here. And if you remember a couple months, we weren't even on, on the live stream or on YouTube. And then we got to realizing, hey, we may be in this thing for the long haul, so we've got to do something to get it on television. And I had another, 
This is the most, I didn't know anything about YouTube. I had no idea. I couldn't even spell it. I had no idea about it. I had a, an email f- from a lady in New Jersey, I believe. I wish I had brought it with me. And she said, I used to go to Broadmoor Baptist Church, moved out of town. I have been watching your Tuesday studies. Can you send me the review sheets? So that's a review sheet request from there, from Virginia, from the Cayman Islands, from California. Here I am. Here's Johnny. (laughs) Okay, folks. Let's get down to business. Okay, matching. John 17, F. It is the longest prayer of Jesus on record. Number two, the hour, H, has come. Do you remember when Jesus said, mine hour has not come for the first time? He said it to his mother in Cana of Galilee. She said, they have no wine. Jesus said, woman, what have I to do with thee? Mine hour is not yet come. And then Mary did the strangest thing. She turned and said to the servants, whatever he tells you to do, do it. There was set there six water pots after the manner of the purifying of the Jews containing about 20 gallons apiece. You remember the story of Cana of Galilee. So his time now has come. Number three, the hour of glory, J, 17-1, 17-1. The hour of power, A, 17-2. The hour of eternal life, C, 17-2 and 3. The hour of his finished work, G, 17-4. The hour of restored glory, B, 17, 5. Number eight, the cross, D, is Christ glory. Now, that's going to be hard for us to understand. When we get to it and see what is happening to him on the cross, it'll be hard for us to understand. This is his glory. Glory, and we'll talk about that. Number nine, E, his validation, resurrection, his validation. If he had stayed in the grave, we would have no validation that he was the Christ. But he came out of the grave after three days validating the fact of his death. He conquered death. The last enemy of man is death. And he conquered it for you and he conquered it for me. And then number 10, I, exaltation. Philippians 2, he took upon himself the form of a servant, was made in the likeness of men, being found in fashion as a man. He humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross, Paul writes to the church at Philippi. And God hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name. So Jesus, the exalted Christ by and through the resurrection. Eternal life is quantity and quality. Quantity The duration is eternal. How long is eternity? Nobody has ever been able to define it. Now, Charles Spurgeon, I think I've given you this once before, but he defined it as a block of granite, 100 miles by 100 miles by 100 miles. Every 100 years, a sparrow came by and wiped away part of the granite. When that granite is wiped into dust, that will be one day in eternity. You can't even fathom that. 
I can't even fathom that. So, what he is trying to say is you cannot calculate eternity. That's what it is, eternal. Quality, we take on the life of God. That becomes the quality of our life, the life of God. We'll talk about that a little more this morning. Christ former summary. He said he prays to the Father to restore him to his former glory. Number one, he revealed God to man. Number one, he revealed God to man. That's part of his former glory. Number two, he displayed his authority in his teaching and his work. Authority in his teaching and in his work. Paul reminds Theophilus of this in the book of Acts. I've recorded all that Jesus began both to do and to teach. So it's the doing and the teaching. Number three, he finished the work of redemption. He finished the work of redemption. And now he will go back to the Father and be at the right hand of the Father to make intercession for us. It is finished. I'm glad Jesus did not say, I am finished. It is finished. The battle is over. All we do is trust him by faith. Number four, the men he called would preach his word. The men he called would preach his word and keep his word. Many call would preach his word and keep his word. Now on the flip side, fill in the blank. In Christ's death, man was at his worst. God was at his best. In Christ's death, man was at his worst, Christ at his best. The, number two, the very life of God has come to us. To us. I just gave you this. Eternal life is both quality and quantity. To live forever in this life would not necessarily be a good thing. To live eternally with God in heaven and those we love will be joy and peace and happiness. Number four, the word became flesh. John chapter one, verse one. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. That's the prelogue to the Gospel of John. Number, uh, that's number five. The Bible speaks about eternal life. You will never find the Gospel writers discussing temporary salvation. It's just not there. It's just not there. I spoke on this Wednesday night last week, I guess. The same grace that saves us is the same grace that keeps us. Now, let me be sure we understand. When we come to know Jesus as the Lord and Savior of life, not speculation, but by knowledge and experience, we know him as our Lord and Savior. No question in our mind, we are saved by the blood of Christ. His grace is sufficient. That same grace keeps us through this life into eternal life. It is not we are saved by grace and kept by works. 
No, no. You do not work to stay saved any more than you work to be saved. Why do you work? Why do you serve God in any capacity? Because that's what he asks you to do. And if we're going to be obedient to God, we serve him. Now, how do we serve him? We're going to get into that partially today by the giftedness that God has given us. That's how we serve him. I feel sorry for the person that has not yet discovered why they are here. You need to know the purpose for life. You need to know the purpose that God gave you for life. So this life of God that comes to us is the life of God that takes us into eternity. So it's eternal life that we receive, not partial life. Does that mean I'll always never sin again? Oh, I wish. It's not so. That's not so. I, I am a sinner saved by grace, and I sin. And thank God for repentance. I am forgiven of that sin. Now, remember, sin is not just what we do. It also has to do with what we think and how we live, how we express ourselves to others in salvation. All right. Any repeat on anything? Okay. Then let's turn to chapter 17 and continue and hopefully get through this great prayer of Jesus. Now I want to pick up on a couple of things before I get into the lesson for today. The background to all of this is the earthly life of Jesus is about to be over. Soon after this prayer, he is, in fact, this is sort of the gateway. Soon he is going to be put on trial, and the mockery of those trials is absolutely unbelievable. He is put on trial, he is condemned, and you remember spineless toad Pilate. Pilate knew he was innocent, but what did Pilate do? He succumbed. He succumbed to what they were asking. It was the custom that the governor had a right to one person being released. They had a notorious criminal by the name of Barabbas. And Pilate said, do you want me to release Barabbas, this notorious criminal who tried to start an insurrection against the government of Rome. Do you want me to release him? Or do you want me to release Jesus who claims to be the king of the Jews? And they said, we want you to release Barabbas. Then what shall I do with Jesus? What did they say? Crucify him. Crucify him. It's an interesting thing. As I read, I cannot find anywhere where Romans crucified Romans. Cannot find that anywhere. They crucified those who were against Rome <coughs> to make a spectacle of him. And you remember, from the very beginning of the birth of Jesus, from the very beginning, there was a fear about this king of the Jews. Herod had all the babies killed, especially the boy babies, two years of age and under. Had them killed in that whole area because he was afraid of the king of the Jews. Now you come to Pilate and he's afraid of the mob and he gives up the king of the Jews to be crucified on a cross, spineless. Uh, I got that phrase from R.G. Lee's famous sermon when he talks about Ahab, who was a spineless toad. Here is Pilate, a spineless toad, who knew the man was innocent, but was willing to let him be crucified. Now what Pilate did not know is that this was God's plan all along. Jesus understood that. 
That's why when Pilate asked, are you not going to defend yourself? Jesus didn't even reply. Are you not going to listen to what they are saying about you and give a defense? And He did not even reply. He knew something Pilate did not know. This is God's plan. I will die on a cross. I will be raised from the grave. I will ascend back to the Father. That's God's plan. And that's what he knows and what he does. So this idea, the earthly life is about over. Now it's not unusual in the moment of death that you think the best things about the person who has died. It's not unusual. Now, that's just simply the human nature. And that's the spiritual nature. That doesn't mean that because they did good things they're going to heaven when they die. No, good people must still be saved by the blood of Christ if they're going to heaven. If you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you're not going to heaven. If you're going to heaven, you go all the way with Jesus or you can't go. It's that simple biblically, theologically. Christ died for our sins. Now, when we know that and understand that, it all comes to bear on what happens on the cross and what happens at the borrowed tomb of Joseph of Arimathea. That's where it all transpires. So here is Pilate who imagines, and he simply is parroting. You mean you want me to crucify your king? And all they would cry out is crucify, crucify. I, I have a sermon I preached, and I, I don't know that I've preached it here. They lost their Hosanna. Do you remember when Jesus was coming into Jerusalem? They brought the little colt. They put their garments on the colt. And they were following Jesus down the Mount of Olives, praising God with a loud voice. And here we find them. The same who cried Hosanna are now crying crucify. Crucify. It's interesting. Then, uh, just simply jot it down, the majesty of Jesus is realized even in the life of the Roman centurion. Matthew 27, 54. Do you remember what he said? Truly, this is the Son of God. And we'll get to that. The cross was the glory of Christ. It's also highlighted for our necessity of obedience. We are to follow him in obedience. William Barclay says, the glory of the cross obliterated, the glory of the cross obliterated the shame um, let me back up. Rewind. The glory of the resurrection obliterated the shame of the cross. The glory of the resurrection obliterated the shame of the cross. Now let me be sure we understand eternal life as duration, as quantity. When we are saved by the blood of Jesus, we never die. We transition from this life to a higher life. We try to describe it in the Word of God. Jesus says to the disciples, let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, you remember the I am, phrases of Jesus, I am the bread of life, I am the light of the world, I am the resurrection and the life, and all of the I ams, and you remember from the Old Testament, when Moses was getting ready to go down to Egypt and tell Pharaoh, let my people go. Uh, Moses said, Lord, I, I'm not a very good speaker. Why don't you send Aaron? 
God said, if I wanted Aaron, I'd said Aaron, Aaron, rather than Moses, Moses. I want you to go, and I want you to make the proclamation to set my people free. Whom shall I say has sent me? What did he say? He said, I am has sent you. I am that I am. Now, you know my favorite terminology. The be verbs carry the, the action of any language. The be verbs. When he said, I am, here's what he's saying. I am, be, am, is, are, was, were, been. I am, I've always been. I am, I will always be. I am, I am that I am. I am Jehovah. I am the God of the ages. There is no God but Jehovah. There is no God but one. <coughs> Excuse me. And this, <coughs> this one God that we know as Jesus the Christ has come into this world, has lived and died, and now he is proclaiming himself to be our experience for eternal life. So we trust him. God at his best. Eternal life we receive and experience. Just the few of the things that we experience. We experience the majesty of Christ coming into our life. The joy of Christ. The peace. What about the peace of God? Passes all understanding. Passes all understanding. And when we understand that and know that and rejoice in that, we know that God is our eternal Father. He also directs our path. Psalm, Proverb 3, 6. Know him and he shall direct your path. To know him is more than just intellectual knowledge. It has to do with intimate experience. Now, let's come to verse 6 through 8, where he prays for his disciples. Verses 6 through 8, praying for the disciples. Chapter 17, John 17, verse 6. I have manifested thy name unto the men which thou gavest me out of the world. Thine they were... And thou gavest them to me, and they have kept thy word. Now they have known that all things whatsoever thou hast given me are of thee. For I have given unto them the words which thou gavest me, and they have received them. And have known surely that I am come from thee, and they have believed that thou didst send me. Now, here he is in these early days praying for the disciples. He prays for them knowing what's going to happen. Now, this is one of the greatest miracles in all of the Bible, in all of known history. These 12 men, Jesus places the weight of evangelism and missions and the preaching of the word on these 12 men, these 12 apostles that he has given them. Now they in turn, understand, they in turn then preach the gospel to others like the apostle Paul. And then he comes to know Christ and he preaches the word of God. Here's young Timothy. He comes to know Christ he, by the way, young Timothy, how did young Timothy come to know Christ? Because of the witness of his mother and his grandmother, he came to know Christ. So grandmothers and mothers, you play a huge part in the salvation experience of your children. 
Now, does that mean that everything you want your child to do and become, he gets in line and says, I'm willing? No, it doesn't mean that at all. But it does mean we ought to take seriously our responsibility as grandparents and parents. Now, I, I, I look at my grandchildren, and all of them are saved. I baptized all five of my grandchildren, talked to every one of them about their faith in Christ beforehand. Every one of them, I believe, are saved. And they're doing things to say to me, yes, it took. It was real. It was real. I'm very fortunate. But now I'm soon going to have eight great-grandchildren coming along, and I'm not going to be around in all likelihood when they reach the age of accountability. So whatever influence I'm going to have, I need to have now, not tomorrow or the next day. Now that's my sermon, grandfather. That's my sermon, grandmother, mother. Take seriously. Well, I don't want to upset my children. Well, I don't want your children to be upset. But I also don't want my children to be upset or my grandchildren to be upset. But I sure don't want my great-grandchildren going to hell because no one told them about Jesus. So we have a responsibility. Now, that's all I'm going to say about that. Just whatever you do, you can fuss at me. You can argue with me. Just don't Ignore me. That's who we are as grandparents. Hey, and if you're honest with yourself, you probably would rather be with your grandchildren than your children. Amen? Yeah. Yeah. So as a result, we have a responsibility. Now, get off of that. Get off of that, John. Go to something else. The weight of the gospel falls upon those of us who are saved by the gospel. Now, he says that God's name has been given to them. In the Old Testament, names are very important. They mean something. When you come into this world, your name means something. You remember Jacob, the deceiver, whose name was changed to Israel after he wrestled with the angel. Your name is changed. Uh, you get your name, I'm, I'm convinced. My own experience proves it. I'm convinced you get your human name in three ways. You get your name by family. Now, that's usually a junior or a third. I've had two young men in my ministry who were the third of the same name, had the name of their grandfather and their father. We called them Trey. One of them was Trey, and one of them was Trip. They went with the third. So you get your name by family, junior, second, third, whatever it might be. Then you get your name by fancy. That's when someone just decides to give you a name. Exhibition number one. My mother decided at birth to name me Travis Jean. That's been my name for all of these years. And no one including my mother, ever called me Travis or Jean. She started calling me John when I was about maybe three weeks old, three days old. We don't know when. It's just always been there. I've been John. Why? Why would she name me Travis Jean? That was her fancy. She really wanted a little girl to name June Travis. Well, you can name a boy Sue, but you can't name a boy June. <laughs> and so as a result, she named me Travis Jean and started calling me John. They asked her, 
Why did you start calling him John? Just looked like a little boy that should be called John. That was her fancy. That was her answer. That was her only answer. That's what I've been all my life. I've been John Sullivan all of my life. Yet that's never even been part of my name. I'm Travis Jean by the fancy of my mother. So you get your name. Some of you know what I'm talking about. You got your name by fancy. Or you get your name by fact. Now those are usually nicknames. Have you ever known someone who was being called slim when that was no longer the caricature of their body? But at one stage in their life, they were slim. They were slim. And that name kept, it took. And so we get a nickname, whatever that might be. Some of you have had nicknames all of your life. That's how you get a name. But your name comes to mean something. I've said to you as I've said to my children, your mother and I are going to leave you a good name. That's about all we're going to leave you is a good name. But you know with a good name, you can borrow any amount of money that you need with a good name. Now try to borrow an amount of money with a bad name. A bad name is hard to overcome. That's why no one names their child Judas. No one I know. No one I know who names their child Nero. No one I know. We name our dogs Nero and our children John. A bad name is hard to overcome. Now, it can be overcome, but it's tough. It's difficult. All right? Jesus has given the disciples. Now, he also wants us to know that in calling these men, God has gifted them with certain things. Now, I'm not going to go through all of the spiritual gift lists today. You can find that in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Uh, you can find it in uh, Ephesians chapter 6, I believe. You can find it in Romans 12. And I'm not sure that you're going to find all the gifts of the Spirit. For instance, there is no mention of music at any point as a gift of God. And who could doubt the gift of music? in the life of George Beverly Shea. Who could ever doubt that? The impact he had in the Graham Crusades. So, the gifts. Let me just mention the gifts he gives to those he has called who are going to take on the work of the gospel, which we call the 12 apostles. 11 at this stage. They're going to get another one to replace Judas. The gift of salvation. The gift of salvation. It is a gift of God. We need to know that. You did nothing to be saved except exercise the faith that God has given you. Every person comes into the world with the ability to faith. Everyone. The difference between my faith and the faith of a lost person is the object of the faith. My faith is in God. That's my worldview. That's my whole life. My faith. Those who are outside of Christ have a different object for their faith. Now, second, service. God calls every person he saves to serve him in some capacity in some capacity, whatever that might be, whatever that might be. And, and we cannot compare. And by the way, it is not one versus the other. It is all working together that makes it the body of Christ. So an ear doesn't say, I'm an ear, nobody likes me. They would rather be an eye. Well, we'd look horrible if all we had was an eye. No, 
The ear lets us hear, the eye lets us see. And so the giftedness that God has given you in some capacity is what you are responsible for. If God calls you to do something, he'll give you the gas to get there. Just remember, God has gifted you in service. Some special gifts in Ephesians 4, he talks about the gift of preaching, the gift of teaching. And then James takes the gift of teaching one notch higher. James said, do not desire to be a teacher unless you want to be more accountable to God than those who do not teach. That put teaching at a high level. Just remember when you're teaching someone the things of God, you are at a high level when you're talking about the gospel. So this idea of teaching, some are gifted to be teachers. Some are gifted to be preachers. God calls us and gifts us to do what he calls us to do. The gift of evangelist or evangelism. Now everyone is responsible for witnessing, but I'm convinced God raises up certain in the congregation who are evangelists. Junior Hill and I are good friends. Junior's been at this church I don't know how many times. One of the best preachers and one of the best men I've ever known in my life. By the way, you need to put him on your prayer list. He is now, he is not able to preach anymore. He cannot leave, much leave the house. And his wife has stage four cancer. So pray for Junior. Talked to him on the phone not long ago. But Junior's an evangelist. He, he was not cut out. He tried to be a pastor. He, he, he couldn't. He, that's not his gift. That's not who he is. So some call to be teachers, some pastors, some evangelists. Now the pastor, the act of pastoring. Listen. I know because I've been there. Pastoring is one of the hardest jobs in the world. And let me tell you why. It's one of the hardest jobs in the world. Because you are trying to help people, some who don't want to be helped. Some who simply want to wait until you do something they don't like so they can criticize you for it. Now don't look at me like calf at a new gate. You know what I'm saying is true. It is hard work. It's a 24 hour seven job when you do it right. It's hard work. And then just little things that happen that folks get upset at you about you didn't come to see me when I was in the hospital. I didn't know you were in the hospital. Well, you should have. How can I know that they're in the hospital if they don't tell me or someone else tells me? How can I possibly know? And no matter what size the church, I've pastored all sizes from 11 to 2100 in Sunday school. My first little mission church, 11, was average, and three of those were us. So I'm telling you, pastoring people is hard work. You ought to pray for our pastor every single day. He has been through enough to kill any average person. And now his brother, 52 years of age, dies in the midst of all of this other that he's trying. Listen, I'm telling you folks, he won't even have time to grieve satisfactorily over his brother's death till he has to make a decision about one of these buildings. I'm telling you, you ought to pray for the pastor every single day of your life. Now... Here we go. God gives us all of these gifts added to those many other gifts. 
And then Jesus gives God a gift. Us. That's all he can give God. Us. That's his gift to the Father. Is us. I thought about that for about one second and I said, Oh, I got much more than he did. God did not get a good thing when he got me. He had to work overtime. Now, I'm better now than I was then. Let me tell you, he's still banging out some dents. Still banging out some dents waiting to repaint the surface. He got us, and we got him. Isn't it amazing? No wonder we sing amazing grace, how sweet the sound, that saved a wretch like me. Now, I know the writer of that hymn was a wretched person at one time. Okay, he gets us. I and the Father are one, Jesus said. Now, I've already mentioned discipleship involves obedience. Obedience. Now, let me just give you very quickly, our time's gone, but I want you to get these in your notes, and I'll enlarge on them the next time. Jesus prays for the disciples. One, unity. Keep them together. Unity. Chapter 17, verses 4 through 12. 4 through 12. He prays for the fullness of their joy. Full joy. Verse 13. He prays that God would keep them from the evil one. 14 through 16. 14 through 16. And number four, that they would be sanctified, set aside, sanctified for the purpose of God. Keep them together, 4 through 12. Fullness of joy, verse 13. Keep them from the evil one, 14 through 16. They would be sanctified, 17 through 19. All right, folks, our time is gone. Anybody have a birthday? Paula had a birthday. Or are you pointing at, oh, Paula had a birthday. You didn't have another birthday, did you? Thank goodness. Okay, anybody else? Who? Okay. Wonder if you somebody could run around there and get her real fast. Ken, can you run around there real fast and get Rita Browning to come in here? Or Dwayne? Dwayne? Chef, would you ask Rita to come in here? We'll surprise her. How many, Ed? Oh, that's pretty good on a nasty day like this. I'll take it. Amen. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, God bless you. Happy birthday to you. Paula, happy birthday. Make him take you out to a big steak dinner. Oh, he already has? What's that? 
Just twice? What a cheapo. All right, let's pray, bless the food, and you'll be dismissed. Thank you, Father, for your love, for your patience with us, and for the joy of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Bless his food in his name. Amen.